Welcome to the Tough Decisions Network for Entrepreneurs. I'm Dan Hanford, and my wife, Danae, and I interview successful people sharing stories behind tough decisions that they've had to make along their journey as an entrepreneur. On the podcast with us today is Lee Miltier. Lee, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Dan. Very happy to be here with you. Hi, Lee. We are looking forward to talking with you today. You know, Dan and I have both heard you speak before, but we've never had the chance to chat. So we're really looking forward to some of the insights that you can give to us today. We'd love for you to get us started by just telling us a little bit about your background, how you got to be an entrepreneur, and then where your focus is right now. Okay, this could be a very long interview, but I'll make that very short. (laughs) I was really born to be an entrepreneur. From the time I was 12 years old, I had 37 people working for me on a ranch out in Suffolk, Virginia. I had a nickname at the time. It was called One More Row because these were all farm workers. And my job was to get them from field to field to field. And the only thing I had to motivate people with was rest and water. And so I really learned at a very young age about money and taking care of yourself and being an entrepreneur. And from there, I worked in a sundry of, you know, different little part-time jobs all the way through high school until I got to be a senior in high school, which I went and then applied for an adult job while I was in high school as a rock and roll disc jockey. And I literally kind of fibbed to them that I was out of high school and (laughs) uh, got the job. And from that experience went into sales. And then a couple of years of selling radio time, I got married and my husband and I actually bought a radio station. And we had that for a while, but our big claim to fame was an electronic background music company. So we put in music systems and shopping centers and airports and, you know, really big stuff. From there, I transitioned out of that due to industry changes and went into commercial real estate. But I've always been self-employed, always been an entrepreneur. I got into commercial real estate at a kind of bad timing for the world. Interest rates were really high. Nobody was buying too much. So I started speaking and there presented me my real talent in life, which was speaking and writing and communicating. And so I anointed myself a professional speaker by going down to the print shop and having cards made that said, Lee Meltier, professional speaker. (laughs) And here I am today. (laughs) That's great. I like that story. That's a great story to kind of get it started. And, you know, it's a true entrepreneur story. And I'm sure along that process and along that road, you've had many, many thousands, if not millions of tough decisions that you had to make along the way. And I want you to get us started in the tough decision, you know, process here with talking to us about a tough decision that I like to call the sore thumb tough decision. It's a tough decision that you had to make along your journey as an entrepreneur And it's one that when I talk about it like that, you probably already are in your head thinking about that one that always comes to your mind about one that had a not so good outcome, but it was a really tough decision, but you learned a lot of lessons through it. So we want to kind of dive into what that tough decision was and some of those lessons that you learned. Well, Dan, the truth is, you know, there's been every day as an entrepreneur, we go, gosh, do I have to make another decision? (laughs) There's a lot of tough decisions. I made a really tough decision a couple of years ago in 2016, and I hired a marketing manager. And as an entrepreneur, I really like to keep my fingers in everything. But there was just so much pressure in the world that, you know, you need all this social media and you need all this, you know, managing all this stuff. And I'd never felt the need to do that before. But anyway, the short story is I hired this person. The bad news about it was, is the person was really a fake. They had incredible credentials, you know, on paper, which I, what little bit I could check. They said they had worked for some big names and we did check up on them, which seemed to be fine. But the bottom line was, it's a person who went to some kind of school to be a marketing 
person. And then the truth was she really didn't have a clue what she was doing. And she ended up stealing from me. And when I figured out that she was a fraud, I confronted her about this. And then she had about an hour and 15 minutes before we kind of kicked her out of the building. And in that time, she destroyed my business by going into LastPass, which is where all your passcodes are. She locked me totally out of my business. Mm. Uh, every passcode was changed, every, even my website. It took me four months personally. So what I really learned from that is if I didn't trust people very much before, I certainly don't trust them now at all. We don't do anything that one person could ever do that again. We don't yeah. have a last pass where they can, you know, with one, one passcode change everything. We also now are much more diligent about going to places like truthfinders.com and, you know, doing a much more diligent uh, research of people before I hire them. I think every entrepreneur sooner or later has the person who wants to kill you because you caught them cheating and lying story. But this was a extremely brutal. And what all of us can really relate to is this is a person I was really good to. You know, her mother had cancer. I gave her mother, you know, some money for an operation. You know, I let her off. I gave her flex time. It was almost the ultimate no good deed goes unpunished (laughs) Hmm. reality. So from that, I will tell you those hard decisions now. I am 10 times slower to hire anybody. I do not have a marketing manager. I'll probably never hire another marketing manager because... (laughs) All they really want to do is every day is nag you about, oh, we need a new video today. Well, I did three last week. I mean, <laughs> I mean, how many do we need? Uh, we must have more articles to give away. We must spend another $25,000 in social media. I was promoting Vision Quest at the time, and I was doing Vision Quest around the United States, and, and they were successful, and we did monetize those very well, but she wasted so much money basically learning on my nickel, and you know, just because people can be great actors and great foolers. Now I'm just much more discerning about who I let in. Where did you originally find her? I originally found her from Facebook, actually, by just putting a notice up that I was looking for someone in my office in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And she had just moved here. And I was looking for someone who had infusion. And the mm-hmm. gal who had been with me for nine years had just gotten married and gotten, was expecting a baby, her first baby. And so she left me kind of unexpectedly. And so I was kind of between a rock and a hard place of, I have this infusion that I cannot run and I need someone who can run infusion. And no one in Virginia Beach has even heard of infusion. Much <laughs> less you're talking about infusion, you're talking about infusion soft? Yes, infusion soft. Confusion okay. soft. Confusion <laughs> soft. You don't mind. <laughs> I've heard that before. So, now, how uh, long did you hold on to her? She was with me nine months, and it was one of those things where you started getting an uncomfortable, intuitive feeling about things. But the last three weeks she was with me, it was sort of like everything was revealed. People came to me and said, Hey, there's, you know, discrepancies, and she said she did this, but she didn't. And, and when I could, I'm a very big confronter. I have no fear of confronting anybody. When you grow up with a six foot five, 300 pound alcoholic father, you are either totally intimidated or you're totally brave. And I'm totally brave. So in retrospect, like all bad things that happen, it was actually good news because mm-hmm. it, I tightened up on every area of my life with every vendor and nobody gets away with an inch of anything. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing I was going to mention to you about LastPass is that I've had that same kind of you know, thought in my mind about that. And one of the features, I don't know how long they've had it, but I, but I know they have it now, is that no longer do you have to give them that master password. You can now share passwords and they can't even see the password. So they can still use that password within their account, but they can't use it. And then the moment you fire them, you can let, you know, unshare that and they never even see the password. Yes, they have informed me of that. I will will just say that here was the real mistake is that I'm the entrepreneur, I'm the visionary, I'm the person who moves the business forward, but I'm not really a high tech person. I mean, I'm good on the computer. I'm relatively, compared to the average person, a high tech person, but not really. 
So when it comes mm-hmm. to this stuff and you have, you've hired someone who's far exceeds your tech ability, yeah. there's an interesting disdain that they have for you mm-hmm. because you're not as smart as they are about tech stuff and they disdain you because literally they can do that, but they can see that you're making a, you know, a lot more money and that you have visibility. And the truth about this particular gal was she wanted to be me. She wanted to be a speaker and an author. And for some reason she thought I was her, I was going to open doors for her. And so, you know, I can't open doors for anybody but myself is and we all know that as entrepreneurs but there are people who will come to work with you and then feel very unhappy because they had some illusions about what you could do for them mm-hmm. and you know it's not our job to do that for them right right yeah. you know i think it's there's an interesting dynamic there that you touched on because dan and i've discussed before about the importance of being able to hire people that are good at your weak areas that their strengths are in your weak areas but you also have to find the right kind of people that are not like like this person where there's not a lot of ego involved and they're willing to do that while you lead the business and and be the visionary as well. Yes. And again, looking back, of course, everything is 2020 looking back. I think the situation was, is I hired her just way too quick because I was losing the gal I'd had for nine years. And that was a very uncomfortable, I mean, she knew everything about the business. I mean, she had gone through, you know, everybody, Anybody and everybody who had gone through Lee Meltier, Inc. So mm-hmm. when she suddenly found out she was expecting and it was a challenging experience for her, I mean, she gave me two weeks notice. I mean, literally in two weeks notice, it's very hard for us to find people to fill the slots that we need. Sure. Well, let's shift here a little bit, Lee, and talk about a different tough decision that has a really good and positive outcome and some of those lessons. Okay. I think some of the good decisions I have made in my life was I pulled my business out of my home about 12 years ago. I had run, I've been in business over 20 years. I had always kind of run my business out of my home and I bought a small office building and that was really the greatest thing I've ever done because productivity has just soared. Working from home can work for some people, depends on your kind of business, but I also do one-on-one coaching. I I deal a lot with the media. You know, you really need a separate space. Plus, the real advantage for me has been I still work from home. I have an office, a writing office in my home, but I'm two miles away from my bricks-and-mortar real office, my publishing company, and so... I am not interrupted every five minutes by my staff while I'm trying to do creative work. So I would say that is one of my better decisions. And I don't like to pay rent. I like to own things. And so this is my my small little publishing house office has been just wonderful. It's in a it's on its freestanding lot. Uh, surrounded by a beautiful yard and we can go out back and have lunch if we want to. I can actually be on the phone outside in a beautiful environment if I want to. I have my own office. We have a conference room for, you know, when clients come, if the media comes or, you know, if you have visitors in any way. And then my staff, there's cameras in the office. I can see what they're saying and doing at all times. I Since this lady left that we just talked about, now, you know, all my computers are loaded with basically spyware (laughs) that, you know, we have put in that we can check everything that you're doing. And I let them know up front, you know, when you come to work for me, hey, this is the gig. You know, there are cameras, there's audio, and everything you do on your computer is being recorded. So there is no strike three with Lee Meltier anymore. It's strike two. I think that's a great distinction. I think it's a great distinction that you just brought up about that decision because, you know, one of the things that I did when I was, you know, right out of high school is work from home and I was out working out of my parents' house. And I was, re- I realized very quickly that I was not as productive there. There's too many distractions. And so one of the first things I did was, is I rented a small 250 square foot room from a friend of mine from church out of his office. And he had, cause I just basically was like, hey, anybody got an extra office I can just get out from? And that is really when my productivity increased, like you said, is that key to productivity where you can have that place to go away 
And I think what you said is, is having kind of a hybrid approach, which is basically what I have now too, is, is I have an office at the house that I can work from if I need to. And then I also have one at the, at the office, an outside office location. And I think that's very key, especially for people who are listening that, you know, might be working out of their home right now and maybe not being as productive, not finding that they're as productive. Well, go find something, whether it be in the beginning, a Regis office or, you know, we work or somewhere, or go find somebody who has an extra office in their own offices until you get to the point where you need a larger office like you have. But I think that's, that's definitely a key distinction that, you know, getting out of the house and having that increased productivity time, I think is very vital. It's crucial because anybody who's working from home, just face it, your neighbors think that you're doing nothing and they're knocking on your <laughs> door and they're, you know, want to talk or it, God forbid they find out you have a fax machine. <laughs> and, and like, oh, can I fax something? No. Oh, oh, and the worst is you have a copy machine, you know, and so... I will tell you that my income tripled when I personally had my staff move out of my house. And for the first time in a very long time, I actually had a home, not a dining room that was the conference room and an extra bedroom that was, you know, my office and another extra bedroom that was, you know, my staff's office. And, you know, we all need, with all the work that we do as entrepreneurs, we really need to be able to have a home. Mm -hmm. We come home and relax and then we cut off for the day. When your office is in your house, there's a tendency. It's, oh, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night before I go to bed. Oh, I'll just check my email. Oh, bad decision. Bad decision. Dan, are you listening? Is, uh... <laughs> well, because I'm sorry, what'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so when we check our email or we start to just dip our head into that office for a minute, uh, you know, two hours will go by. The black hole. The you black hole. Disappear. <laughs> And, and we won't even know it's two hours that has passed, but it's just not healthy because your subconscious mind actually needs periods of time of rest. Mm -hmm. well, if you really want to be creative, and I'm a writer, and so, I mean, I need to have certain times it's an absolute hard shutdown. And I cut my computer off at certain at a certain time every night. And I don't go check the email on my phone or my iPad or the other 25, you know, gizmos that we have to keep us distracted. But again, separating myself from the staff during very high creative times, having the office out of my house and having very hard shutdown times every day has been very profitable for me. Well, Lee, I want to kind of shift gears here just a little bit and ask you to talk about some of the strategies that you like to use when you are facing a tough decision. That is a great question because, you know, most people don't really ask you about the strategies. So a tough decision, we should not be impulsive about tough decisions because you can, if you come from a fear or your any kind of fear based about the decision, then you're reactive. And when you're reactive, you're going to agree to things and do things impulsively that later you will regret. So normally when I have a tough decision, I, I give myself anywhere from two to three days to mull it over. And I will often say to people when they push you, you know, I'll get back to you in three days. What happens is, is that, you know, just like, all other processes emotionally that we go through, you go through stages. And so first that might be a shock. And then there is, you know, sometimes fear of what would happen and then the risk and the money and, and have you done it before and all those things. I am a very spiritual person. I meditate. I spend a lot of time in nature. I spend a lot of time with animals. I have horses and dogs and cats and, and all kinds of uh, expensive animals. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I live on the beach. So one of the things I diligently do is I, I do a list of, you know, the advantages and the disadvantages. I do have a board of directors that is not an official board of directors where I'm paying, but sort of mastermind people that we call each other our board of directors. I'll touch base with them. I will go into nature. I will meditate. I will actually give myself time to really intuitively feel what I call the head, heart, gut check. So whatever decisions I make, good or, you know, whatever they are, first, they have to bypass my left brain. 
which is the critical brain part of making decisions. So if I'm going to make a decision and my left brain says no, then I'm going to go and ask my heart, does this feel right to me? And then the most important place I check is my gut. There's more blood, and they call this your second brain, actually, in your Mm -hmm. belly. So I can tell how my body feels about decisions. And so all that melds together. But I'm not one to just impulsively make decisions, even though my personality can be very impulsive. But when it is a big decision, I like to really think on it for a while, check again with my so-called board of directors, you know, see how I feel, put it aside for a few hours and come back to it. I think we all make much better decisions when we're not reacting to the current circumstances. So let's say if we got into a seminar and all of us see this all the time and okay, oh, you have two hours to make this decision or the offer goes away. Well, I'm out. Mm Mm-hmm. Because if anybody has to force me into a decision, I really put on the brakes. Because Mm -hmm. if a deal is good, it's going to be good 24 hours from now. Oh, yeah. I feel exactly the same way. I hate feeling pressured to do something. And I think a lot of times we let outside people, but we also sort of deceive ourselves into thinking that, oh, I have to make this decision right now. When... I mean, the number of decisions that have to be made right now are so, so the percentage is so small compared to, you know, the number of decisions that we make all the time. So, yeah, I think you're exactly right. And I I think that's good advice. We're going to take a quick break and hear from one of our show sponsors. When we come back, we'll talk to Lee about some of her favorites as it relates to her life as an entrepreneur. Have you ever thought about investing in real estate, but find yourself so busy that you don't have time for it? Do you have FOMO, which is the fear of missing out? At HanfordCapital.com, we help investors with passive real estate investments that project better returns than traditional investment vehicles, such as the stock market. If you'd like to find out more about our passive real estate investments, visit HanfordCapital.com. That's H-A-N-D-F-O-R-D Capital.com. We will jump on a call with you to discuss your investment goals and to see if our investments are a good fit for you. This advertisement is not to be construed as an offer or recommendation to buy or sell a security. Visit HanfordCapital.com. All right, we are back with Lee Miltier, and we're going to go through a series of quick questions and answers that we call the trifecta. And Lee, we want you to get us started by telling us your favorite technology that you use in business that helps make your life easier every day. My favorite technology... Spell check. (laughs) 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 Because I, you know, I'm a writer and not necessarily the greatest speller on earth. So um, I love spell check. I know that sounds silly, but I mean, it's as a writer, it's just, you know, invaluable. I love Zoom, by the way. Um, I do a lot of work on Zoom. I do all, I would say 99% of all my coaching on Zoom. And that is just a, a, a fabulous service. When you're using Zoom, are you using the audio only when you're coaching? Or are you trying to do the one-on-one via video as well? No, I use video. Okay. I, I figured I, you probably I, did. I was just curious about that. I'm a very expensive coach. I believe they deserve to be able to see me. (laughs) And and, And I am a high intuitive woman. I'm a former professional photographer. So body language and energy and eye contact. And I, I mean, I can tell you all about a person by just looking at their picture. So when I can see people, I can intuitively read them much better. What is a favorite quote that you've heard that has helped you as an entrepreneur? Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, she can achieve. <laughs> and, <know> what's, <laughs> and what's a favorite book that you've read that has helped you make better decisions? There's so many books. The book that I think that I like is Power Versus Force by Dr. Hawkins. It's all about really the level of energy in things. So, for instance, truth has high energy and lies have low energy. Learning to discern and read energy fields with people, that's why I'm such a good coach, helps me tremendously know when they're telling me the truth and when they're not. What's the next thing for you right now on your vision or your dream board? 
The next thing for me is I'm going to Japan for a month to speak to a number of different groups. I'm very excited about this. I've had a publisher in Japan for 12 years. So all of my products have, uh, they secured all of my products and the rights to my products. And my big business is called Millionaire Smarts Coaching, where I am a content provider for many people around the world, 250,000 people around the world, to be exact. And so my next big thing is really Asia. I'm going into Asia, China, Hong Kong, and we're doing educational courses all translated and things like that. So I'm super excited about that. That's pretty cool. How can the listeners reach out to you if they want to follow you or contact you or get some more information from you? Well, I do have a free e-zine each, each week. It's called The Gems of Wisdom. And if you went to my website, which is com, and let me spell that for you, M-I-L-T-E-E-R.com, right on the screen, you can sign up for the free e-zine. But I do have a gift for everybody for listening to me today. It's If you go to a website called fivetypesofenergy.com, F-I-V-E, types of energy.com. I will send you a $97 gift for free. It is five short videos on the different, uh, what we call our energy currency every day. And everybody has it. You have mental currency, physical, emotional, spiritual, and financial currency. And if you can learn to, it's really manipulate reality better by understanding the energy of your life and how you're using your energy and what is benefiting you and what is depleting you. So this is a five short little videos and people play these in schools. They play them in churches. They play them in businesses. I urge people, if you've got kids, you know, teenagers play them. It's the topic that our society is oblivious of and doesn't really understand. But once you get it and how that you have five types of energy every single day of your life to manifest, particularly as an entrepreneur, what you want, you'll be much more selective and discerning about who and what gets your energy and then how you're spending your energy and programming your own subconscious mind. Well, and I want to, you know, tell you that we'll put the links to that as well. So for those of you who are listening, you can go to toughdecisions.net and uh, find all those links on the show notes for this episode. And Lee, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to be with us today here on the podcast. And we look forward to continuing to follow you as you continue to grow as an entrepreneur and looking forward to having you on a future episode as well. We would love that. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Tough Decisions Network. Be sure to visit toughdecisions.net to gain access to show notes for this episode and to join our free weekly entrepreneur email where we will send you news about the latest technology for your business, inspiring quotes, and the latest books for entrepreneurs. That's toughdecisions.net.